Good morning, Illini. Welcome back. I'm your host, Matt Schrock. Once again, here with Healthy Illini Podcast, and we are into the fall of 2023. And I know we say it all the time, it's amazing we're here already, but we're already cruising right through the semester and jumping into midterms and finals around the corner and breaks and all those fun things. But as we're talking today, we, we, we've talked about a lot of different aspects of, of wellness and health and wellness on this program. And today we're talking about one that's a little bit different maybe than something that you may expect, and that is financial wellness. We did one earlier on episode 15, so if you want to go back and look at that on budgeting, You can check that out in our archive. But today we're going to do a little bit of a different aspect of finances, and I'm ready to jump into it. My guest today is a senior lecturer here with the Geese Department of Finance out of Geese College of Business. Sterling Rasky is joining us. Sterling, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, He's been with UAUC about seven years. Um, and then has been in wealth management industry, in the wealth management industry for about 18 years. So there's a lot of expertise here, a lot of experience, uh, a lot of perspective that I want to tap into on this. Um, but, and like I said, you know, we, we talk a lot about health and wellness, um, here at Healthy Illini and there's a huge range of, of, of what that could mean. Uh, immediately we usually go to the big three, uh, physical health, nutrition, and mental health. Those are kind of three, we talk health and wellness. Those are the buzzwords that pop out there, but financial health falls in this category. Mm-hmm. And and um, that's an important thing for anybody, whether you're starting out as a as a freshman on campus, or you're starting out trying to figure out where you're going and how to manage your finances, or you know you're middle of your life and now all of a sudden it's not just you; you've got a family that changes kind of how your finances go. Or later in life, you're looking to retire. So so financial health is something that is huge throughout our lives. Um, but today, I want to really talk about the college student aspect of it, where you start with. And have that introductory conversation, kind of how we how we begin, and some guidance on that. So let's let's start with uh, somebody's listening in. They have no idea what we're talking about. They know you know finance. Uh, they've heard investing. Um, these are words that yeah, I've kind of heard that is, is floating around, but they don't know what that means. Um, so if you would start, uh, Sterling, just what are some types of investing that a young adult, especially college students, should maybe be considering or at least be familiar with? Yeah, I think to start out with. Uh, one of the, uh, in addition to their college education, which I think is one of the best investments that they can make, uh, if if done correctly, you know, we're not talking about Tommy Boy or Van Wilder, <laughs> <laughs> but from the uh, from the standpoint of even before graduation, uh, just educating themselves on what they might be interested in, whether it if it's investing in, uh, for example, a lot of my students have questions about investments for retirement. You know, even though they're in their early twenties. Uh, before they know it, they're going to be in the thick of things. And you and I had talked before the podcast started about getting an early start, getting a good jump start. Things become a habit, and it's a lot easier to maintain than it would be to uh, uh, to start something when you know somebody's in their late forties or or fifties. Starting out as as boring as this sounds, I think one of the best investments uh, a recent graduate can make is paying down their debt. Uh, and I say that from the standpoint of you're looking at, for example, if you have a 7% interest rate on your student loans, and I'm just using that number arbitrarily, by paying down that debt as soon as possible, you're putting that 7% in your own pocket versus paying it to you know the lender. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one one area that I, I strongly encourage. I'll never tell my, st- my students what to do, right? Uh, but I'll, I'll give them encouragement and things to consider so they can make uh, more informed decisions. Uh, but that's also a there's a there's a balance there. There's a fine line between paying off debt. There's a fine line between saving for retirement. Uh, you're going along keeping with the mundane <laughs> is uh, before they even consider investing, making sure that they have a good foundation when it comes to you know, the most basic thing of an emergency fund. You know, if they lose their job or there's an emergency that happens, they don't have to tap retirement accounts, which can be, pretty penalizing from a tax and penalty standpoint. Uh, they don't have to figure out the wrong way to use credit cards <laughs> and, and get into trouble that way. So having a little bit of that base in an emergency, you know, usually three to six months of expenses put aside that, hey, if something goes wrong, they've got a cushion and they don't have to alter their life too drastically uh, from that standpoint. Now, once all those things are figured out and going back to that fine line, that balance, when they're thinking about investing, I think a great place to to look at is, for example, in their employer retirement plan, 
very common students get access to a 401k. So a lot of times those employer plans have access to what are called mutual funds, which are essentially, and I'm, I'm really um, making this as simplistic as possible, mutual fund is essentially a holding place that will hold a number of different stocks. It may hold a number of different bonds. It could hold a proportion of, say, 60% stocks and 40% bonds. And it allows students to get access to those types of investments without having to necessarily put all of their eggs in one basket. I, I like that you brought that up because y you made a good point that, you know, they're in their early 20s and they're not thinking retirement yet. But I remember being in my early 20s and starting a job and they stuck this retirement fund in front of me. And I was like, I don't even know what these mean. Mm -hmm. And I'm making decisions right now that will affect 40 years from now or whatever it may be. And I'm trying to figure out what's the best, what, what do I, what do these mean? So I, I, it's great that we're, that you're, we're talking about this now because these students will graduate, they'll go and some will find, you know, jobs that have really great retirement plans, mm -hmm. but they have no familiarity with what the details of those retirement plans are. And you mentioned, you know, it may be partially stocks, it may be partially bonds. What's the difference between stocks and bonds? Let's start right there because, you know, some students may have no idea. They know stocks are stock market and bonds are something else. And that's the extent of their knowledge. So if you could very quickly just kind of explain what the difference is between stocks and bonds and a very short pros and cons for both. Okay. Uh, and let me, uh, so we'll step out of the retirement plan for just a second, the 401k, and just generally speaking. So stocks represent ownership in a company. Uh, and most people are familiar with the big publicly traded companies. You know, you think Google, Meta, Amazon, Exxon, you know, AT&T and so forth. So if I purchase stock in one of those companies, I become a shareholder. I become a partial owner. Um, I'm still a teardrop in the ocean when it comes to that ownership, but I'm, I'm still a partial owner. The upside is I have ownership in that company, so I get to participate in their, in their profitability, their earnings. Some of those companies pay dividends, which is essentially the companies returning a portion of their earnings to the shareholders, which adds to the, to the money that I make on that stock. But there's also more risk. Right. In the event that the company, uh, unfortunately, may file bankruptcy as a common stockholder, as a shareholder, I'm generally last in line uh, when it comes to the, the, even the potential of getting any of my money back. Uh, the flip side of that, if we're talking about bonds, bonds are essentially debt. Right. So if I purchase a bond from any one of the aforementioned companies that I just said, uh, what I am doing is purchasing their debt, and it's an agreement to, in exchange for them borrowing my money, I become a creditor. And depending on the maturity of the bond, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, for example, during that time, they pay me interest payments. So it's, a, it's a, no different than having a mortgage on a house. Hey, I get to borrow the bank's money, but I have to pay the, the, the money back with interest. The companies borrow money from me as a bondholder. They're paying me interest. And then when the bond matures, I get my money back, essentially what's called the principal or the power value of the bond. Pros and cons, stocks generally, not always, generally have more upside. There's some potential for higher return. Bonds, they're not the most glamorous thing to talk about on a Friday night, you know, and, and homecoming. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe around the Department of Finance in the parking lot there, they'll, they'll be a big hit. But uh they're generally safer because bondholders are creditors. So the in the event of a company collapsing and going into bankruptcy, bondholders are, come above uh, stockholders with regards to potentially getting their their money back. So yeah, I mean, stocks are really there's a higher there's a potential for higher reward, mm -hmm. but there's definitely a higher risk that's tied into that um, as opposed to bonds that you kind of know what you're getting with with a bond. Um, lower risk, but you're not going to have that all of a sudden upswing that you're your value is going to you know, triple overnight kind of kind of deal because it just because of the way they're structured. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So let's talk about and just real quick, uh, I don't want to spend much time here, but an IRA, because that's mm -hmm. another another thing. Stocks, bonds, IRAs so is the kind of thing to hear a lot of. Mm -hmm. What is an IRA? So an IRA is another stands for individual retirement arrangement. Colloquially, people say individual retirement accounts. So they're an additional retirement account for specifically for individuals that as long as somebody has earned income from wages, you know, W-2 income from working at their job or self-employment income, they're allowed to save into this individual retirement account in addition to saving into their company's, let's say, 401k. So it's just another way to, uh, to save money for retirement. Individuals can't save as much 
So for example, individuals can save $22,500 into a, this year, into a 401k, uh, age 50 or older, they're allowed another $7,500 catch up. IRAs, it's $6,500 with another $1,000 catch up contribution to the IRA. So both are retirement savings vehicles. IRAs are a little bit limited with regards to how much you can put in. And with the Roth IRA, individuals might be further limited with regards to if they make too much money and their adjusted gross income is too high, they can't directly contribute uh, to the Roth IRA. Okay, last term I want to kind of uh, have you uh, talk about before we get into the next section, which is more of a practical kind of idea around mm -hmm. investing. But uh, the other thing that a, a student might hear, they're like, what is that ROI, return of investment? Mm. What does that mean? Yeah, so I it, to stay uh, in the theme with uh, with going to college, the ROI is hey for the tuition that I pay, the time that I put in for four years or six years or however many years that you know I, I go to school, the return on my investment is, and I, I always make the analogy with my students, probably the biggest reason why you're here. If you can say education and that's great, the experience absolutely, it's return on investment for your time for your tuition dollars you're expecting to receive a higher paycheck having gone to school for four or six years than you would if you just went to went to work right out of high school. Nothing wrong with either, but the expected return is much higher for having put in the four years of time and money to increase their education, increase experience uh, through college. From a pure investment standpoint with regards to money, ROI is simply, hey, if I invest $1,000 and I get $2,000 back, that increase, that gain of $1,000, that's my return on my investment. And again, we're being very simple in these conversations. Um, there's so many factors that go into all of these things, stocks, bonds, uh, return of investment, but but that's a general idea. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I found it, it, as goofy as this sounds, the more simple, it doesn't have to be complicated. I tell my <laughs> folks all the time, it doesn't have to be rocket surgery. You know, typically the more complicated or if uh, uh, Wall Street invents a better mousetrap, uh, investors are usually the mice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we, we we laid some groundwork, we laid some structure to kind of have more conversation here. So I'm I'm a student, I'm a young adult, kind of starting on my own. Um, whether I'm you know freshman, senior, graduate student, whatever, and I've set my budget, I've got a good plan, I'm I'm pretty secure, I've got an emergency fund, I've got all these things, and I have a little bit of disposable income. Um, and uh, I decide that, you know what, I want to start now and see if I can turn this disposable income into some sort of return um, on an investing on that. Uh, where do I start? How, how do I start looking into, I'm not in a company yet that gives me an, a retirement account that has some choices for me. Okay. I'm just a student, you know, and I've heard trading. I've heard online trading. I've heard, you know, about stocks. I've seen stocks that go up and down. I've heard, you know, all these things. Um, where do I start looking? And kind of as, a, as an aside on that, is there an amount that, that is recommended to say, okay, you have this much of a nest egg to start with, or is it, you know, $5 okay, or do I need, you know, $100, or uh, where do I start if I'm, a, if I'm a student just trying to get, an, get my toe in the door? Yeah, I, I think a great place to start, um, number one, is to ask even family members, asking mom or dad, hey, just been thinking about this, do you have any, any insight for me? Uh, they can be a wealth of information. Uh, after that, as... If I may, use your instructors, your professors as a resource. And I'm happy to, anybody listening to the podcast, they can look me up in the directory, shoot me an email. I'm happy to to walk them through this. I I, I think it's part of the, uh, the tuition that they pay, you know. And so just asking around, asking their, again, instructors, professors, there's a wealth of knowledge here uh, at this university. I don't think they need to be, but some might feel embarrassed, you know, asking their instructors, like, you know, the embarrassment of, ah, you know, I, I should know this, but I don't, don't really want to ask. Uh, you know, an online search, you know, just going to a reputable website such as uh, Morningstar, going to uh, a company like Vanguard or a company like Fidelity, all of which Charles Schwab, those are different uh, investment companies. And these aren't endorsements, by, by the way, they're just, you know, companies that uh, have been around for quite a while and have uh, renowned knowledge, customer service, uh, et cetera. And they can just start searching in there. What is this type of account? What's the difference between a, just a brokerage account and a retirement account? How are they taxed? What are the, what are the differences? What are your minimums? You know, and in some cases, uh, there are some companies where, you know, their minimum is if the share price is $27, that's the minimum share price. To, <laughs> if that's the minimum price to get into that share. If it's a mutual fund that holds, you know, a number of shares, uh, 
a number of stocks or a number of bonds, it might be 50 bucks a month um, as an automatic investment. So those are those are great ways to uh, to get started. And it might be, hey, I'm saving 10 bucks a month into my savings account. Once that 10 bucks turns into 100 or once that 100 turns into 1,000, then I'm going to take that chunk of change and do the investment uh, at that time. And what it allows the person to do is then to do some research uh, on what type of investment they want to do. I think what, I think impatience can be to a person's detriment. They really want to get in, they get excited, they hear a friend and uh, always, they always hear about the friend that, <laughs> you know, got a, a 10 times multiple on their right. investment. It sounds great, but their friends usually never tell them how much money they lost. Right. <laughs> so they're hearing all the, all the good stories and, uh, the, uh, the news stories of how these people made, you know, yeah. six or seven figures overnight. Uh, it's rare that you hear about, oh man, they, they lost all their money and now they're in, you know, they're going to lose their home and their marriage is in trouble and, and all that jazz. So, oh, it's a lot like any, any, you know, we, we, we like, we like celebrity, we like, uh, happening now, but it, you know, you see the next big celebrity that came through and like, oh, they're big in this movie or that you didn't see them in the small parts, the commercials they did, the waiting tables for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, the point. extras. Yeah. You know, they, they were an extra for 10 years before they got their shot. Yep. You know, you just, and the same thing with investing. You don't hear about the, the money put, the, the failed ventures or the the not as glamorous, you know, maybe not maybe not, ne not necessarily negative, but not the as glamorous positives. And all of a sudden the explosions come and you hear that. You're like, oh, that's what I'm going to do. Right. You're right. And patience is Patience is huge. Right. Well, it's, I shouldn't say everybody. There are a lot of individuals that aspire to be Warren Buffett, yeah. right? But very few know what he actually did, even as a child, to get to the point where he became the Warren Buffett. You know, he's the Warren Buffett now, but when he was 10, it was like, it was amazing the stuff that he was doing to educate himself to get to the point to where he is now. And I would argue luck has a lot to do with it too, so. Yeah, I mean, if everything were certain in the stock market, let's talk, talk there, you wouldn't see all these stories of, of people that have invested and lost because if you, right. if you could predict it perfectly, everybody would make money off it and be exact, but we know that's not the case. Right. So, uh, so yeah, so you're coming back to, you know, that idea of you just want to start, you want to, you, you want to go and you're, you're, you're talking about a lot of things. And as you were talking, I can picture some listeners going, oh man, that's a lot like mutual funds. And now we're talking this and, and minimums and things like that as, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot necessarily, but. Um, as someone who's been in, in the wealth management industry, as someone who knows a lot about finance, do you recommend going through a broker the first time you step in? Or is that online, on my own, you know, E-Trade kind of idea? Um, is that somewhere that's a good place to start? What are the pros and cons for both? Yeah, typically if, if going through a, a broker or a financial advisor, there's going to be some additional costs incurred. To, you know, it could be a sales charge or a commission based on the sale. It could be... Uh, an hourly fee, you know, to help them out with the investments. It could be, sorry, you don't have enough money for us to even be interested in talking to you. You'll, you'll need to go somewhere else. <laughs> so there's a number of different answers they can get. Uh, let's, let's stay with the, if they go to work with a professional, first and foremost, make sure that professional is a fiduciary, which means they are legally obligated to act in the person's best interest. That being said, can it be done without the help of a professional? I think it can. Th this is just where patience and time and education comes in. Because if really, what if I'm hiring a broker or a financial professional, I'm using my money to leverage their knowledge to help me out. And is it worth the money that I'm paying them? If I don't want to do that, well, okay, is it worth it for me to have patience and before I invest to leverage my time and a couple of hours at the free library here on campus to educate myself more on what types of investments I might be interested in. Is it stocks? Is it bonds? Is it mutual funds? Uh, the, uh, the great Peter Lynch, he ran the Fidelity, uh, Fidelity Magellan Fund, a uh, wildly successful fund in the, in the 80s. And I forget what, which one of his books I'm getting this quote from, but he has stated that uh, individuals will spend more time researching an appliance purchase than they do the stocks <laughs> that they want to buy. So you know, to the students that are listening, individuals listening, it's if, you know, whatever thing you're passionate about that's not investing, if it's video games, if it's fashion, apparel, your hobby, and you put a lot of time and effort into that, put that same amount of time and energy when it comes to investing your money and, and increasing your net worth, if you decide to do it on your own. And yeah, that research of specific stocks. Um, so we're going we're gonna to kind of uh, dovetail into the next, the next point on this, um, but for researching Mm -hmm. stocks for anything 
and if I'm a student here, and I love that you said, you know, hey, look me up if you need every. I love working on this campus because there's so many people here that we care about students. That's why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to be invested in their lives. We want to be a part of that investment of the time here. And so we want to help. So um, what are some recommendations do you have of resources here on the campus for if somebody has a question about stocks and bonds or they want to do research? Where do they look? Um, is, are there, there you know, databases or, or websites that you can recommend just uh, to say, hey, this is a good place to just jump. There's a good jumping off point. Yeah. I, I mean, it, the, the libraries are a great place to start. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to, I would argue probably the finance section, not going to be very crowded. <laughs> <laughs> so finding what books are available and then just asking for more information, I go up to the, uh, to the counter and say, Hey, I'm looking for more books on, um, on X, Y, and Z. Is it possible to get a hold of them? Uh, a colleague a number of years ago pointed me out to uh, an app called Libby and I'm allowed to use the app to access audiobooks for free that the university provides. It's absolutely, use it all the time. It's absolutely fantastic. So that's, that's one resource. Uh, I think another resource is, and I'm sorry to sound like a broken record is, uh, leveraging their instructors, even if they're not taking a class with that instructor. Um, I've had plenty of folks that are like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I haven't taken any of your classes, but I was talking to a friend that had, do you mind if I run something by you? Absolutely. It might not be instantaneous, but uh, you know, I'll make the time. Uh, they just have to be willing to ask. And I think that they'll find that with pretty much every instructor here. They're happy to share what they know. I'm happy to share what I know. I'm happy to share what I don't know and where I've made mistakes. Hey, so, so do what I say, not as I did, because <laughs> you'll be much better off. Sometimes that's the most valuable, you know, learning. It, it's, I, I found in my own life that asking somebody and finding out where they had issues has helped me avoid those same issues. Yeah. Um, and that, that's a huge part of it. Um, and that's, you know, you find somebody who's willing to say, hey, this is what I did. It didn't work out so great. Avoid this. You can save yourself a lot of steps. Uh, a lot of struggle um, in that as well. So that's that's absolutely uh, fantastic on there. Um, and just in general, like searching, um, if somebody wants to go on and just look for, you know, the background on stocks or the predictions on stocks or things like that, is there anything that you you recommend there? Is, is there any database that ties into the, the stock exchange and gives you some information? If you like, hey, I saw this stock, you type it and can give you some information on it. Oh, I mean, you, you can do that in Google and Google Finance will pull up all the statistics you could want on a publicly traded company, you know, what, I mean, really to the granular level of, of different, you know, the PE ratio, what are their earnings for this quarter? What's the dividend? What's the beta, which is just, you know, the risk of the stock compared to the, to the overall market. Yahoo has a good database as well. There are, if they really want in, want to get into the nuts and bolts of the company, uh, they can search SEC databases. There's one called Edgar, uh, that they can look into and find out as much as they want to about the company. Um, even, believe it or not, even the company, if it's a publicly traded company, going to their website in and of itself, clicking on the link that says investor relations, all that information's public. You know, whether or not, how, how do we interpret it to figure out what sure. we need to know is a little bit different, which right. is where uh, your databases come in handy because they do a lot of that information dissemination for you. Um, but you can find out, you know, exactly what you need to know, uh, just have to know where to look. So those would be some, without inundating the students with so many, so many different things. I know finance students get access to certain things that maybe other majors might not be, be privy to, um, but it can certainly be done without having access to yeah. complex things. The world we live in, everything is accessible if, yeah. you, if you know where to look. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't know where to look, if you're the person to ask on how to oh, find And it. that's really, that's what it is. So if I'm putting myself in their shoes, it was a matter of asking questions and just saying, hey, uh, and I try to do that now as I, oh, I remember, like you said, asking those questions, if I can avoid that mistake. And then I think, uh, with the folks that I talk to, if I'm letting them know, Hey, I made this mistake, it lets them know, okay, he, he's human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, that's a huge part of it. Cause okay. you know, th th that fits into this. We, we talk about it on a lot of different topics here that we are on a, a brilliant campus. And part of the problem, the benefit and the problem of that is we have brilliant students who often Many students think they're the only one struggling or the mm -hmm. only one not knowing. Um, ask the questions yeah. because everybody's trying to figure it out. You know, nobody is a is a whiz at everything. Um, we all have our strengths, we all have our weaknesses, and together we can avoid mistakes and we can get stronger. So yeah, ask those questions and uh, ask, especially when it comes to every aspect, including finances, mm -hmm. um, because the, the finances is something that if you can set up some good habits now, 
and get some just get some knowledge now. It's like you said with Warren Buffett started early and that grew into what he is now. It wasn't he didn't all of a sudden wake up one day and have an epiphany and know all things. You know, right? Uh, he he grew into it, and that's something that our our students and any listener can do as well. No matter what point you're starting at, whether you're 18, 38, 58, mm-hmm. there's always a chance to start something um, and and take a step in in towards a uh, solid financial health and financial wellness. It's amazing. Time always goes so fast and I feel like there's so much we didn't cover. Um, but, but this is one of those topics that we can really go in depth in and there's so much. And so, um, this we just want to start the conversation Mm -hmm. and we hit some really good points. So, uh, Sterling, I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Your time in college is a time that you, you set habits and benefits for yourself for so many things, so many aspects. And uh, as we talked about, the return on investment, your education is a huge part of that. Um, But the education doesn't just happen in the classroom. Education happens in your home, how you eat, how you exercise, how you sleep, how you organize your day, how you approach your studies, how you approach your social groups, how you approach your finances. And uh, money and the, the, the money that you have, the money that you make, how you turn that around and use it in your life is a huge part of what you start to learn here in college. So if you're curious about investing, whether it be stocks, bonds, retirement funds, real estate, um, collectibles, you know, whatever investment means um, for you, and you have questions, please reach out. Reach out to us here at Healthy Illini. We'd love to point you in the direction of anyone who can give you the answers. Reach out to the to uh, Geese College of Business. Find some uh, people there who are knowledgeable about finances, about investing. Ask them. Ask your friends. Ask your parents. Um, get some knowledge on that because it, it will only help you as you go on. Because as we said, when you leave this campus, you're going to start a job and right away you're going to be making financial decisions going forward. And so the, the more knowledge you have, the more power you have, the better state you'll be in. But thank you for joining us today. You're on a personal journey, no matter where you are in it. You are important and you matter. Your health and wellness are important and matter. And we're here to keep you well to excel. So go have a great week, Illini. Let us know how you're doing and we'll catch you next time on Healthy Illini.